Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Off Farm Income Podcast. Thank you so much for joining us here for another Tuesday edition episode. Really appreciate you being here, everybody. And uh, this is our no frills intro on our Tuesday edition episodes. Well, as you know, on Tuesdays it's just you and me, and uh, this is an, this is a, I guess a, a weekly episode or an edition of the podcast that we started a while back just because when I did solo episodes, I heard from you and many of you said you liked it. And so I thought, well, this is a great opportunity for me to catch you up on what is going on with our farm and our endeavor because after all, this podcast and my entrepreneurial journey was all started so we could have our farm just like what you want to do and also so I could spend more time and do a better job on my farm And now live full time, spend all my time on my farm, unless I want to leave to go do something not farm related, like ride a motorcycle or something. But uh, other than that, all my time, my workday, all of that is spent right here on my farm, which is a a great benefit if you're trying to do well as you're new and you're a startup and you're a small niche farm, just like we are. And so no matter where you're at in your journey to agriculture or anything like that, uh, we hope we've got something here for you, and on Tuesdays, it is just, uh, it's just you and I, and it's a nice conversation to have, and I always try to keep you updated on what's going on. Well, I titled this, uh, I titled this episode, They Never Say Thank You, and They Think That You Want to Kill Them, because at, well, I don't know, every year, this time of year, so you guys all know that we raise goats, and now we raise goats as a compliment to our cattle. I really, really like the multi-species grazing. I like what they do for the pastures. And so we raise goats as a compliment to our cattle. But uh, what I've been realizing more recently is that all the work we do to direct market our cattle and to to direct market them and and to raise them, we keep them over the winter and we finish them out on grass and, and we market the specialized product to our customers. The actual return we get based on live weight is about the same as we could get for just hauling goats down to the butcher, or not to the butcher, excuse me, to the auction, and just dropping them off and, and letting them be auctioned off. The The goat price has skyrocketed so much that uh, we can get the same price per pound on a pound of goat meat uh, that we don't do any extra work on and we don't hold over the winter as we can on the beef that we do all that extra work on. And honestly, the only thing keeping me in this direct market beef business is because that's why I got into farming. That's what I've always wanted to do is to raise cattle. But if this was just purely, just a strictly financial and business decision, we would have nothing but goats on our place. They've turned out to be that good of a uh, of a business, uh, livestock business. Now, putting all your eggs in one basket, probably not wise. So we're staying diversified and we're staying with beef cattle, but we're also increasing the number of goats we have because just by happenstance, we've discovered this market and uh, man, it's, it's a great way to do it. They're really easy to keep for the most part, but this title of this episode is about those moments when they are not easy to keep. So this time of year, every year, our kids get big enough, they start getting themselves into trouble. And so how do they do that? Well, their horns, because we don't dehorn them, their horns have gotten big enough that they will stick their head through our field fence to start eating, and then they can't get their head back out. Because the horns go through very easy, they don't come back out very easy, and only the smartest, oh, I don't know, 95% of our goats can go, oh, I got this figured out. They know how to turn their head and get everything back out, but there's always this like 5% of goats that cannot get it figured out. And so this time of year, uh, there's plenty for them to eat within the fences, by the way. But of course, the grass is always greener. They're browsers, so they get bored with everything we have in the pastures. So they're sticking their head through the fence and they're wanting to eat other stuff. And so this time of year, uh, we always have a few goats that just are constantly, constantly, constantly getting their heads stuck in the fence. Well, we've got this one goat. And by the way, I've got them all identified. And uh, one of them is going down the road very soon, and I'm happy about that. The other one is a very good-looking female out of one of our best does, and so she is staying on this farm. So I cannot wait for those horns to get big enough. She can no longer get her head through the fence, so this will all stop. However, in the interim period, this continues to go on and go on. And this little female... I will, I, I, this is one of those times where it is very apparent that our neighbors are way too close because when she gets her head stuck in the fence 
And she's got a great mom. Mom won't leave. Mom's out there basically calling for me to come get her out. I will go out to get her out of the fence. I am telling you, with I when I get within five feet of this goat, she starts screaming like I am torturing her. It is unbearable. It's like a blood-curdling scream, like she is being killed, like there's a coyote attacking her right now while she's stuck in the fence. And I haven't even touched this goat to get her out yet. And I get her out right now one or two times a day. I am not kidding you. And for the first time ever, I got her out last night at 2 in the morning because she happened to come up by the house, stick her head through the fence right near our bedroom window, and then was screaming. And obviously there was no sleep going on. And I don't like a goat being stuck all night with her head in the fence. So I got up at 2 in the morning, went out, and got her head out of the fence. And I will tell you what. These goats, you go and help them. And this is true with any livestock, by the way. Whether it's your pigs, whether it's your cattle, your sheep, your goats, chickens, whatever it may be. For the most part, they think that you want to kill them. And you, then you go and you help them. You dust them off. You might even pet them a little bit while you got a hold of them. If you're getting them out of a fence... And, of course, you never do anything harmful to them, and they never, ever say thank you. Now, I know that's a silly statement. Why would they ever say thank you, or why would you even think they're capable of that? I get it. There's no gratitude there, and that's, you know, they're not humans. I understand. But it's one of those things where over and over and over again, they act like you were just there to do them harm when you're just just there to help them. And it's and, and there's no gratitude. It's going on all the time, over and over and over again. And it's one of those things when, uh, you know, on a daily basis, it, it can get frustrating. At two in the morning, it is downright aggravating. I will tell you what: at two a.m., when you were getting a great night's sleep, and you're getting woke up by this, man, it is downright aggravating. But anyway, eventually. She will grow up big enough that this will stop, and I'm sure she's going to be a fine, fine doe, but oh my goodness, does she make it seem like we want to kill her. It is just crazy. So that is, uh, that's is—that's the current state of affairs. It's funny how on a farm, and when you're raising livestock, you're raising crops, whatever that may be, every different part of the year offers you something new and something different than the previous one. And this is that phase of the year. Right now, for us, this is the phase of the year. I'm getting goats out of the fence and we're eating sweet corn we just started eating our sweet corn and man do i love to grow some sweet corn and i'm a horrible row crop farmer i think i've said that before on the show but uh, i do love to plant some sweet corn it's relatively easy to grow uh, in perspective to other things and of course it is undeniably delicious so uh, very exciting stuff there i get excited this time of year last year uh, or last year last night I actually ordered a, uh, a uh, I don't even know what you call it, but a container where I can make sauerkraut. I'm going to make my own sauerkraut. Obviously very proud of my German roots, my German roots that ended in the 1750s when my ancestors left for Russia from Germany, but uh, proud of that and uh, going to make my own sauerkraut. And uh, we'll see how that goes. It's always an interesting, interesting experiment. Well, you've probably been seeing all the news about the fires in California. Well, I will tell you, my old hometown of Modesto, California, Stanislaus County down there, and then Valley Home where I grew up, um, they are just, uh, all my friends are telling me how just inundated with smoke they are, just covered in smoke, just totally covered in smoke. And um, it's interesting where we live in southwest Idaho, we generally get two, one of two different patterns of weather. We get weather that comes out of California and it moves north, northeast, or we get weather that comes out of Seattle and it moves southeast. The, we get one of those two weather patterns. Now, my favorite, my preferred, is always the weather pattern that comes out of Seattle. That brings more precipitation when we do get snow here. Generally, the snow is coming out of that, that pattern coming from the northwest to the southeast but a lot of times when we get a high pressure system it's moving weather in from california or in the winter when we're getting rain when we're getting warm rain that's coming in from the southwest to the northeast and whenever we get that pattern 
our airflow, our weather, comes on that trajectory. And ironically, it almost comes directly from Modesto or from Stanislaus County, where I grew up, to CUNA, where we now live. It, it's this funny irony that I've noticed. And you can you can look at satellite images and you can kind of track the clouds. You can see it's almost a direct line. Well, that is going on right now. Well, I've got all my friends down in Stanislaus County telling me how bad the smoke is from the fires that are to their west in the intercoastal and the coastal mountain ranges there around Santa Cruz uh, to the east of San Jose. Um, and, and a lot of people don't know this, but San Jose is actually not that far from where I grew up if you go as the crow flies right over the mountains. And so Stanislaus County's western boundary is on a ridge line, which meets Santa Clara County's boundary. Uh, so they border each other on a, a very sparsely populated uh hilly area we're talking we're talking mountains that top out at like a thousand or twelve hundred feet but get very very dry covered in oak trees and dry grass all summer long always a tinderbox always a tinderbox well they meet up there and those fires are all throughout that area and man once they get going if the weather conditions are right they're just unstoppable and they just produce a ton of smoke um, and it happens more and more and more there's lots of explanations for that I'm not going to go into all the deep reasons uh, why I believe that's happening, but more and more and more. As a matter of fact, I try to think back to my childhood growing up down there and try to think of times when we were inundated with smoke in the San Joaquin Valley or the Central Valley of California. I'm sure it probably happened at some point during my childhood, but I've got no distinct memories of it, which to me indicates it didn't happen that often but it is happening more and more down there that is a change we're seeing anyway so all those fires are going on all where i grew up is to the east of that that's the natural airflow and so all my friends are inundated in smoke but here in the treasure valley of idaho we are as well now that is a frequent occurrence where i live in idaho uh, in august of almost every summer almost every summer we're going to spend some days shrouded in smoke and it, it's not always as a matter of fact normally it's really not an indication of the fire activity in, in Idaho, although we do have a lot of fire activity in Idaho and out here in August. Uh, it's not always an indication. Most normally, it's an indication of fire activity in California and in Oregon because of that, when we get a high pressure system, because of the way the air flows through Northern California, right through that Modesto, Stanislaus County area, directly to us here in Southwestern Idaho, in Cuna, in Boise, and in the Treasure Valley. And that is going on right now, and we have been covered in smoke for about a week now. And that's something that if you're going to live here, and, and we do live in a wonderful place, uh, but that's something you have to learn to live with. A couple of years ago, it was horrible. It started in late June, and it went almost into late September. It was really, really bad. There were huge fires in the West. We had big fires here in Idaho as well. And it just never, ever let up. It, I've just got, you know, the fires are horrible. Uh, there have been fatalities. There are people who are losing their homes. It's never a good thing. The one bright spot for me this year is it really did not kick off for us until late August, which means we're going to have a very, very short season of smoke here in the Treasure Valley. And it does appear that our weather pattern is changing uh, here in about two days uh, where we're going to get more into that seattle flow and so we're not going to be getting that smoke from california so i've got my fingers crossed for that i would love it if uh, a weather event would come into california and shut those fires down for those folks because i know how miserable it is i know how dangerous it is and uh, i mean it's the sheriff's department i used to work for in stanislaus county is doing evacuations over in the, the western part of that county so uh, obviously i i'm very very empathetic to what's going on down there and people trying to get livestock out people losing their ranches, uh, you know, having to rebuild all their fences, their homes, their outbuildings, all of that. It's a horrible, horrible deal. And then with as many people that live in California now and, and the cost of housing down there, so many people have built houses and entire subdivisions in interface areas, and those places are highly at risk as well. I have family right now who have been evacuated near Vacaville. Uh, because of fires coming down towards them. And as a matter of fact, as I record this, I don't know if their house is standing or not. I saw photos the other day that fire was very, very close by. So this is part of living in the West. It's it's one of the dynamics of living in the West. And uh, I do believe it's worse than it used to be. I believe there's a lot of reasons we could point to. And like everything in our country, all of it seems to get politicized 
Uh, but uh, with all that said, uh, people are going through it in California. And this is, uh, you know, this is, I, I was talking to a friend about this the other day. I think what's going on in California right now with all these fires is akin to like the Loma Prieta earthquake they had in 1989 in San Francisco or the Northridge earthquake they had in, I want to say, 1994. Uh, in down in Southern California, I might be wrong on that date. Um, but anyway, I think it's akin to those things, those type of natural disasters. Because if you look at what happened, we got really deep into summer before there was really any massive wildfire activity. And then about 10 days ago, something like that, a series of storms rolled through the coastal ranges of Northern California with unbelievable amounts of dry lightning. And this is another thing that, as I think back to my childhood, was very rare. Thunderstorms down there generally came in the spring, sometimes in the winter, and in the fall. But in the summer, super dry with not a whole lot of thunderstorms. Now, of course, it happens every now and then. But now with the advent of social media and all the friends and family I've got down there, looking on social media, seeing all these pictures people are posting of this lightning storm that came through, pretty phenomenal lightning that came through just about 10 days ago down there and started all these fires really a very very rare event and just could not be worse timing absolutely could not be worse timing to start with so start so many different fires down there so they're going through a pretty historical natural disaster down there right now and of course we're looking this week at a couple hurricanes uh, developing and maybe strengthening out in the gulf coast which is something we're always looking for this time of year but if you look down at what's going on in California right now, uh, it's undeniable uh, the impact it has on people and uh, and the, the damages that are being done. And really, uh, a historical weather phenomenon came through and a and a you know a combination of circumstances to kind of put this all into motion. So uh, you know we're praying for everybody down there and uh, got them in our thoughts always and. While I'm looking forward to the smoke clearing out of where I live here in the next couple of days, I realize that it's not going to be the case for, for those folks until they get some significant precipitation down there. And, uh, you know, in that part of California, that could be October. So we'll see what happens. We'll see how long this goes. But hopefully as the temperatures cool and things calm down, uh, they can recover from that. And, of course, uh, the significant fire season in Southern California is just getting ready to get kicked off. So we'll see where this all goes. Uh, it's very interesting how that goes on every single year. Well, hey, everybody, let me acknowledge our great sponsors here really quick. Of course, Lacrosse Footwear. Absolutely love these people. Done right since 1897. Lacrosse Footwear has been making quality boots for hunting, working, and tending the land for over a century. And uh, just like every day of the year on our farm, I've got the Alpha Range boots on my feet as I go out and I do my farm work, whether I'm irrigating, I'm feeding, whatever that may be. And it took me a long time to find the lacrosse alpha range boot. But once I did, I have not looked back. Still holding up just like brand new. And uh, we're going on two years in this one pair of neoprene-based rubber boots, everybody. And once I found these boots that work so well and stood up to the work I do here on my farm, that is when I sought out lacrosse as a sponsor. And they've been a great sponsor of this show. We want you to make solid investments. We want you to get the most for your money. And I'll tell you what, you're absolutely going to do that with the Alpha Range boots from Lacrosse, please check out everything they've got to offer you over at lacrossefootwear.com. And then, of course, Powder River Livestock Handling Equipment. Man, we just re-upped with Powder River again. I could not be more proud to be affiliated with a great Western brand, a historic 80-plus year brand, making the equipment that ranchers need to handle their large livestock. Now, out here in the West, we run cattle out on the open range. They're not around people, but maybe one or two times a year, which means they revert to some of their baser, more wild instincts. They are not used to people. But we've got to get up. We've got to get close to these cattle, right? They need vaccinations. They need to be treated for uh, external, internal parasites and things like that. They don't like that. That means we've got to have livestock handling equipment that moves them in a humane way, in a way that reduces stress as much as we possibly can, and in a way that minimizes any potential for injury. And that is the type of cattle that Powder River has designed their equipment for for over 80 years, being based out here in the West with all the public lands we have out here. 
What we want from you is we want you to let your local farm and ranch retailer know you want this type of equipment that is going to handle your cattle humanely, as stress-free, and as injury-free as possible and help you get the job done in a way that you truly enjoy those days when you have to work cattle or when you have to treat a cow or treat a calf. Let your local farm and ranch retailer know you want to see that Powder River Green out in their sales yard so you can also have the finest in livestock handling equipment and you can find everything they've got to offer you over at powderriver.com. All right, well, one last thought. Uh, last night was a great night. So last night, uh, it was Sunday evening. Yes, it was very smoky here in the valley, but like I said, here in southwest Idaho, that's just something we get used to every August. There's always a little bit of it. And uh, dove season's coming up. So as I'm recording this, it's the 24th of August. That means in eight days, dove season's going to open up. That's been a tradition in my family, uh, especially, well, only on my mom's side, uh, going back to the farm down in Sanger, California. That has been a tradition for decades. I mean, we might be we might getting close to a century on this tradition of dove hunting and uh, kicking off the season uh, dove hunting. Well, last night, uh, Autumn's, Autumn's stepdad, uh, Hattie's grandfather, came over, and uh, we uh, went out in the pasture. We set up the clay pigeon thrower, and we've got Hattie a uh, 20 gauge shotgun we got her out there shooting clay pigeons getting ready for dove season and another generation is about to carry the the tradition forward and i could not have been happier to watch her shooting to watch her progressing to watch her knocking down those clay pigeons and to be getting excited for this time of year and uh, hey it's coming right up on us uh, the start of dove season is always the marker for me to say we're we're rolling right into fall it's the beginning of September, dove season is coming, other hunting is coming, and now I've got my daughter actively involved in it, and it was a family affair. We had a nice family dinner last night, shot clay pigeons both before and after dinner, and uh, it was great. Just that smell of, of gun smoke, you know, in the air, and uh, of that burnt gunpowder, and watching those clay pigeons go down and, and knowing everybody around us that can hear it knows exactly what's going on. And that is we're getting ready for dove season. It's, it's a very, very exciting time of year. And I hope you're excited by this time of year as well. I mean, working and living in agriculture, it just doesn't get any better because uh, it's not mundane. I mean, if you think about it, and if you're still in this situation, you know, I know you're doing what you have to do. I'm not trying to say anything bad about it. But if you're working in a climate-controlled office, except for you're going to and coming from work, every day is the same. It's 74 degrees or it's 78 degrees or 72 or whatever in your office. The lighting is the same. The temperature is the same. You know, everything is the same day after day after day. And it doesn't matter what time of year it is. It's the same. But for those of us that work outside, we work in agriculture, we have livestock, we're raising crops, there's always something new coming. And there's little markers and indicators that remind you of what time of year it is. And you may not you may not ever think about those markers or those indicators. And then when they happen, you go, oh yeah, this happens every year. Just like with my goats getting their head heads caught in the fence. I go, oh yeah, it happens every year this time of year. And with the, you know, have that happening, and then the kickoff of dove season and the smoke rolling in, even though I don't like the smoke, it's all an indication of the progression. And if you're outside and you're working in it and the weather and the, the conditions outside are important to you and your livelihood, well, then you notice all those things and they all make a difference. And that is one of the parts of working in agriculture I love. A good friend of mine, Tyler Turnipseed, once said to me, and this is years ago, 20 years ago when we were finishing up at Montana State University, said something just like, isn't it great to work in a profession where the weather matters, where you have to pay attention to the weather? And I think he's absolutely 100% correct about that. I love working in a profession where I have to pay attention to the weather. It brings me so much in tune or more in tune with what's going on out there around me. And it's, it makes me happy for me, but it makes me happy for all of you as well. And hey, look, if you're still in that climate controlled office and you are dying for the day you can get out of it, you can get out of it. You will make it happen. 
That's what I'm here to help you do. And that's what there's a lot of people out there that are there to help you make that happen. And that will happen for you. But everybody, I love it. I know you do too. And uh, thank you for joining me for this Tuesday edition episode. Everybody, as always, enjoy your journey to the ultimate lifestyle business, agriculture.